My name is Andrew Bray, British Red Cross uh, Maps team. I'm here to talk about missing maps with uh, Joe and Martin. Um, this is a relatively new initiative. It's just gone through its year anniversary. Um, it's pulling a lot of things together. Uh, it's very, it's a very shared collaborative space. It's not owned by any particular institution. Um, it's building on a lot of things that have come, come before. I am going to do um, five minutes. Uh, Joe's going to do 10 uh, and Martin's going to do 15 because he's the data guy and that's why you are here because of the data stuff. Um, some, some people. Yeah? Some people. Some people. Um, we overlapped uh, in a very organic missing maps -y community way. So the same way that um, the Wikipedia community, uh, the OpenStreetMap community and in this case the missing maps community, kind of sub communities within that. Yeah, so we all represent very different perspectives. Um, Martin is very interested in the community data. Um, Joe has spent time uh, in our team, actually, and in the MSF team, Doctor Without Borders, um, and is now sort of using some of the data coming out of the process. Why missing maps? Why are the maps missing? Um, so people are like, but maps exist. So this is a place called Baraka um, in the Congo, South Kivu, a place that MSF is very active. This is 100,000 people um, without a Starbucks. And this is what life looks like on Bing and Google Maps without traditional commercial activity. Um, this is what that looks like in terms of settlements and actual houses if you mapped it. So this is one of the first target areas of the Missing Maps project. Um, MSF was already doing things there. They were like, this is ridiculous. But yes, that's why we're doing this whole project, is to map areas like this that have humanitarian interest but relatively little traditional commercial interest. That is all the paperwork there is to missing maps. Um, and basically what we're doing is saying we really like OpenStreetMap and whoever is interested in missing maps plays by their rules and their rules. So humanitarian OpenStreetMap, OpenStreetMap, um, and map the most vulnerable, do it in an open way, put people first, put open data second. That's, that's the entire detail. Um, that's the detail that one can get bogged down in. And the fact we got it down to one page, I think, stands up to how, how clean the space is in terms of um, if you're coming to that table, you're, you're coming to this, basically. Me meaning, to make it explicit, what we're what we presenting here tonight is not the work of a singular organization. It's the work of multiple actors, or many individuals, who come together under a memorandum of understanding. Yeah. And that memorandum of understanding is very much underneath the humanitarian OpenStreetMap teamwork. So it's building on everything that OpenStreetMap and humanitarian OpenStreetMap have done. And these organizations, NGOs, um, development aid agencies are all tapping into in very different ways, but both supporting and benefiting from having a better relationship with this process and this data. That's basically what we're trying to do. We're still figuring out what all the benefits are. Um, as it evolves, we will evolve to um, take advantage of the opportunities. As our uh, field work evolves, as the people get more involved, as the data gets richer, um, the difference between having no map to roads, to roads and buildings, to roads and buildings with names on it that you can rely on in the local language is very much an evolution. Missing Maps is about starting that process and kind of pushing forward on it. My newest slide. Uh, so, open street map community, very open, very virtual. Humanitarian open street map community is a very small subset of that that focuses on the humanitarian use cases and trying to push instead of map my run or map my coffee shops or map my pubs, they're like map where places in the world we care about where there is vulnerability. Um, they're very good at maps, they're very good at GIS. Humanitarian organizations um, with a little bit of GIS capacity, slowly going to, starting to ask the question, hey, you guys do it really well, how can we engage with that better? Missing maps is building that bridge. Um, and it's a very open space. Um, they're not there, we're not there, but people process tools, data. Um, it's 
amazing how much of OpenStreetMap is about the data, um, but massively the, the people, the process, and the tools, the transparency and shared understanding and shared tech and shared resources is a big one um, that Missing Maps is trying to take advantage of in a slightly more um, focused way than would normally happen. This is one of the kind of uh, views on the Missing Maps community. So very traditional NGOs. Um, they've been going a long time. Uh, they're centralized. They've got a very focused purpose and they're different. Um, structured staff, accountable, funded, donors' interests. Um, they have to make stuff work. They have to keep stuff safe. They have to get projects done. They have a whole lot of constraints on them that mean that they have to be quite rigid in their approach compared to the virtual, very adaptive community um, of OpenStreetMap and HOT. Um, missing Maps is linking those two and trying to take the best, the strengths of each one and kind of overlap them, giving more of these people access to some of the benefits of that and giving these people some of the access to the benefits of that. The goal process is basically we map an area, um, we get local validation and input, and then we can do better aid. That's kind of, we're sort of start, there was like a needle and we're like, you know, and depending on the project and the location and the tools and the tech and stuff, we, we can easily trace the satellite imagery. Um, where we're working is, uh, and, and how, depending on the quality of the data, and then that actually making a difference to the kind of aid we can deliver. So being able to look up somebody who goes into a clinic, um, if they tell you the road they're from, in a local language, can we look that up? Like that changes how we are able to respond to an epidemic. This is what that means in reality. So that means that this is what remote mapping looks like. People drawing blocks around buildings um, and roads. And this is what field, the kind of thing that field mapping looks like, which is people literally adding local context. Once you print out what's happened here, you print it out, put in whatever you can, however you can, and then get it back onto the digital map so you can be iterated on in future. And that's the high level context. And I'm gonna pass you up to Joe, who's gonna give you more of the, the field side um, case study. And yeah, we'll go from there. So my name's Joe, and um, as Andrew said, I worked for the last two years on and off as a volunteer for the Red Cross and MSF GIS team. Um, and I am now doing a PhD. Ooh. And I am basically one of these children sat right here. Um, my PhD is looking at how you can mine people's metadata generated from their mobile phones for good. Um, so the organisation I work with was looking at flows of people after the Kathmandu, um, out of Kathmandu after the Nepal earthquake. And I'm kind of working on data to do with that, which is very, very much big data for development, which is what this series is about. I'm about to say, well, actually, you know, what Missing Maps is more about is looking at the basics, like trying to get the basics done. And this is what <laughs> I'm trying to illustrate with this cartoon. So coming here today, I'm really lucky. We're all really lucky. We live in a surplus of spatial data. Like, Luckily, I've been in Oxford for a while, so I know where I was going. But if I didn't know, I could have got out the train station, Googled Oxford Internet Institute, and there's my direction straight here. Or, for example, to keep me going for the presentation, I could have found where my coffee is, you know, key amenities. And if I ended up fainting after this presentation, I know exactly where I need to go to the John Radcliffe. And we take all of this for granted where we know where things are. Not everyone is quite so lucky, as the wonderful map shows. You know, there's a lot of places which don't have places on the map. And that's what obviously Missing Maps is trying to counteract. So as Andrew says, we do a lot of remote mapping, which is a map -thons. We have one every month. We extend it, we've extended, I'm running them in the University of Southampton, there's Edinburgh, Chambéry, Paris, many places where we're doing this. We're mapping buildings, we're mapping roads and waterways, which is great. We're getting lots of stuff put on the map. But the issue is we still don't have any local detail and we don't have any local context. You know, like I said, into Google or even into street map in the UK, I can add these, put these questions in and I'm going to find out where it is. However, this space, Raffia, 
you're not going to know where things are. And these are actually quite crucial for humanitarian organisations such as the Red Cross and MSF to know where things are. For example, where is the nearest hospital? If I've got a load of patients coming to me with a virus, where do I send them? And even to things like the mayor's office, who do I need to go talk to, talk to to ensure that my vaccination programme runs? Ooh. And with satellite imagery, digitising isn't always enough. You know, we can't actually interpret everything. For example, I spotted a few buildings. They're bigger than all the other buildings, so I know it's not going to be a residential building. It's probably going to be something else. So is this the school? Or is this the hospital? Or what else could it be? Could it be the market? But if I look across, then there's some more buildings, and this kind of looks like a playing field. So is this the school? I'm not too sure. And as a result, we've got lots of mappers sat in our mappathons going, I don't know what to do. How do I tag this? How do I try and tell the community what this thing is? And that's why we need things like local knowledge. So these are hand-drawn maps um, showing different areas where different schools, um, places of worship are. And this is the sort of thing we actually need to get on the map <laughs> um, for example, this gives you a, a lot more detail by having extra things on the map, particularly with communities such as you know, schools and hospitals, and these are things that are needed. So how can we get the information onto the map? Well, as Andrew said, we've got a three-stage process, and that's what I'm quite talking to you about briefly today, which is this second stage, which is how we use um, community volunteers to actually engage in their community and map local areas. And I've just got a few examples of what the Missing Maps Project has done over basically the last year. So this is really fresh. This would have happened a week and a half ago, um, where the, one of the Missing Maps coordinators took one of the volunteers over to Katanga in the DRC. And this is kind of the process of how we map things in the field. We take a big map, or lots of sections of the map. We decide how we're going to map it. We go out with tools, whether it's something called, which I'll explain in a bit, mainly smartphones. And we record locations of where people where things are, names, etc. And then, if anyone's ever done anything to GIS, uh, this guy's expression might <laughs> resonate with them. Uh, we try and get it back onto the map and onto OpenStreetMap. And we're really, really lucky because there's so much out there that we can use to be able to get things onto the map quite accurately. So when we first started mapping in the field, we used these things called field papers, which hopefully you can kind of see is a map of the area and then a coordinating table, so you don't end up scribbling all over the map to say this is a school and you're going to end up having this on route, <coughs> but a coded way of mapping an area that's been previously mapped up at a mapathon. And we've used this in Bangladesh, so this is one of our volunteers out there mapping um, local road names. And we've also, he's in the same photo, uh, from Lumbumbashi, which is a really popular place for MSF. Um, they work a lot out there, and so hence why they're doing such a big map of the area. And doing that, we've been adding street names and buildings to the map. We also do other things, and that's not come out very well, but we also use GPS points and tracks. But GPS really has been, um, what's the word, taken over by actual using smartphone surveys. So the amount of people who own smartphones up out in the countries are working is, is, is quite a lot. It's a huge proportion. And there are some really great open source tools out there. Um, open Data Kit and then Open Map Kit, which was pretty much developed by the American Red Cross, based on Open Data Kit, where we can do things like this, um, where we can take surveys out there, record the locations, and add extra bits of information. And with Open Map Kit, you can even see the pieces, the things on the map on your phone. So you can actually go in and directly edit OpenStreetMap, and then upload it later. So back to Dhaka, <laughs> we went on another field trip using um, Open Map Kit as well. And we also went off to uh, Bushirumbo in Tanzania and did more mapping um, with smartphones and it's, it's, it's a really accessible way to get local co volunteers involved because it doesn't require much more and the training is really really <coughs> simple um, and here we're mapping water points and boreholes so it's not just hospitals and schools it's, it's a lot of things that we we like to map and as a result we in the last year have run i was trying to count we've been to nine at least nine different places 10 now with katanga and i think we've probably run about 15 or 16 trips which is more than one a month, basically, since we started in January last year. Um, we started off in Bangladesh. We had a first trip where we went out and mapped the slums in um, the slum areas in southwest Dhaka. And this is the Kamarish Jagar, can't say it quite right, Kana. And we've managed to develop something that looks like this. 
which, because the resolution of the screen isn't great, but all of these are schools and mosques and um, hospitals that are available to local slum dwellers. Um, and then we had a second trip in the summer back to some other different places in Dhaka. We've also run a project in Zimbabwe where we are still uploading data on boreholes and wash services, so understanding basically, um, if you can see these little icons are taps and buckets, so understanding where you can access water and sanitation facilities. We've also run a massive project, as I said, Lombombashi is a really popular place for MSF, to basically map the entire city and in particular map road names. So um, again, <laughs> sorry for small pictures, but as you can see, all of these are road names all around Lumbashi, which you don't have that sort of detail on anywhere like Google, Bing, etc. And then another massive um, African city we've also been mapping is Bangasu. And there we were actually, rather than focusing right in on the city, we're looking around the local areas and looking at health areas and finding out village names, which is really important. So this is the city itself where we've done a lot of remote mapping. But what we've actually done with help of local MSF workers is ended up adding a lot of village names to the maps, as you can see, if you click blue. And then on top of that, we've actually mapped where local hospitals and pharmacies are, and then local churches and mosques. Again, all really important for NGO workers when they want to say, where do I send people, or where can I put people if we need to get together? And then we had one extra special project, <laughs> which was meant to be my presentation focus, but anyway. Um, and this is a really, really interesting project because it just shows how you can do field mapping at large. Um, so Sierra Leone, if you obviously remember, um, Ebola happening for 18 months, and we had MSF workers out in the field not knowing where people were coming from. They didn't know the villages, as Andrew said, if you wanted to be able to record um, a patient's name, you wouldn't know exactly where they came from. So one of the workers at MSF said, right, I've got a great idea. Um, I'm going to map all the villages in Tonkali district. So this is the district just right at the edge of uh, Sierra Leone. And this is kind of it in numbers. He basically hired um, nine teams of two volunteers, local volunteers, always using local volunteers, where we had one motorbike driver and one surveyor, and basically paid them a bit of money to go out with a smartphone and map any village that they came across. And not only map the village itself, but also add in lots of other data for example, um, household estimates, and then more medical orientated data, such as the health worker, health worker phone number, which you can imagine is very useful for people like MSF or Red Cross. Um, and basically, within a week of doing that, nine teams, they managed to map 740 villages, which is quite a considerable amount. I think I worked it out to be, they covered about 7% of Sierra Leone in total land area um, in a week. Um, and we added 330, 335 new villages to OpenStreetMap. We also updated 405 villages with alternative village names, which is really, really important if you have someone come to you and say, this is my village, and OpenStreetMap only has one version of how it's spelt or how it's pronounced. You need alternative names to help make sure you're talking about the same village. Um, and what it ended up working out with price, it was that it was a £3.50 per village to map. To get just that map, to get that village on the map, and to get this extra bit of data. So, just because we like maps here, this is what it looked like. This is how many villages we managed to map with the new villages in blue, and then also the existing villages in pink. And what was really, really important was those household counts, because from that we can start to estimate how much of the population and where the population lies. And what you can start to see is where you've got a huge amount of population to concentrate, and where not so much. And that would it's really useful when you're trying to plan. Um, vaccination programs, etc. So that's kind of our work in the field so far. Um, I think we keep doing more and more trips um, with new aims and places to map. And I'll hand you over to Martin. Thank you, Joe. That was super interesting. I'm I'm going to talk about the the other side. So you you saw this three step uh, program or the, this three step sequence. Um, Where did you put the? Just close that one. Close that one. Yeah. 
So Joe, Joe was talking about the, the work in the field. Um, be before we go to the field, there's the first step, um, which involves a significant number of volunteers, which is almost entirely online, which is the step where we take satellite images, which have been provided from a number of sources. Sometimes it's Bing, sometimes it's this other satellite image provider. And then we set up a process where online volunteers can help us trace these satellite images identifying villages, identifying houses, uh, uh, roads, and so on. They won't have the names that, that are then collected later, but it at least gives us a base map that we can then operate on. And it's also, and this kind of work is also much less effort to coordinate and to do at large scale, because it's very easily distributed across large numbers of people. Um, so I'm, I'm the... I'm, I'm a PhD student as well, and I research community engagement within the humanitarian open street map team. Uh, however, I focus on the, the online community aspect. And I, I particularly do that because the work that people do is readily available for us to see and, uh, and, and to analyze, whereas it would be much harder to observe what happens during, uh, during one of those field trips. So if, if we look at the, the, the online community to date and the, uh, the activities of the online community, um, people started uh, creating these kinds of projects sometimes in 2011, 2012, um, and uh, it, was a, it was a steady growth of, of new initiatives. And up until today, we have about 1,200 projects that were created, where a project is the ambition to map a particular area based on satellite imagery. Um, and in total, about 20,000 people have, uh, have contributed. Uh, over um, an estimated 150,000 uh, hours of work have been provided by these volunteers. Um, and about 120 million edits were made to the global map as a result of this work. So this gives you a sense of the, the kind of scale that uh, uh, that, that the initiative uh, operates under. But it also gives you a sense of, of uh, 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 sometimes to us it feels like uh, there, there's almost uh, uh, no ceiling to the apparent growth uh, of this community. Um, however, when, when you then look at the areas of where people map, so Joe showed us the, the, the pins on the map. This here is a, is a heat map of places where actual edits happen. You do see that there are certain uh, regions of interest, like here, Central and West Africa. A lot of this was after the Ebola epidemic, where we re realized there are vast areas where people live there, but there are no maps, but then also many other areas. Um, however, we also see there are still many places that are on map. Um, and additionally, there is also, um, there, there still are, even, if we, even once we created all these maps, there are still instances where we need to update them. There might be um, just uh, uh, these might just be ma uh, questions of regular map maintenance, or it might be the case that there is a natural disaster that completely changes the landscape of of a region. Uh, so again, in order to for aid teams to then do field logistics, they need updated maps. They need to know which streets still exist, and so on. So back back to the the, the online community that produces the base maps. Uh, most of them when they sign up and they start producing maps are actually new to OpenStreetMap. Um, can, can I ask who in this, in this room has already heard of OpenStreetMap before you, before you came here? It's about maybe a third of the room. So OpenStreetMap, in, in case it wasn't made explicit until now, is, is an online mapping community. It's a Wikipedia approach to making a map of the world. Anybody can produce maps, on, uh, can help con 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 contribute to the map on OpenStreetMap. And without OpenStreetMap, our work would not be possible. So we produce these maps for humanitarian purposes, and the volunteers that join our efforts, most of them have not heard of OpenStreetMap, and they don't need to. But it, it but for us, that's that's uh, useful to know. Um, is also the fact that we, we also see that many don't actually stay stick around that long. Uh, uh, the median contributor contributor lifetime is about a day. Uh, meaning about half people, half the people, they, they map for a bit, for, for an hour or two, and then they stop. Um, there's, as in any other online community, there is the, there's a long tail, and uh, the, the, most highly, the most engaged contributors, they're highly engaged. 
the top 20% of contributors, they, they keep mapping for at least 16 days over, over their full activity period. So let's consider these numbers. Is, is this a lot? Is this little? Um, what, what could we compare it against? I think if you compare it to uh, a classic uh, volunteering organization, an hour of work by a contributor, like the median 70 minutes of a contributor is maybe not that much. However, if you, com if you think of it as an online activity where people have all kinds of distractions and they're on Facebook and a friend just sends them a link, hey, did you see Peter mapping for Nepal? And then they sign up and then they do 70 minutes. That's a remarkable achievement. And this, this high contributor turnover also allows us to do the kinds of projects we do. A lot of the, uh, the mapping initiatives, they require a substantial amount of work. As, as Joe illustrated, they cover vast areas. Um, so, and a lot of them are only possible because we can distribute the work across large numbers of people, where every individual maybe only does a little, but the, the, the overall output is massive. We, what we're also seeing is that there are certain kinds of uh, emergency disaster responses that draw large crowds. In the early days, Typhoon Haiyan was, was one of the first instances in, uh, in uh, uh, 2013 where large numbers of people participated in mapping e efforts immediately after the event. Um, the Ebola response in uh, throughout 2014 was a more sustained effort, but also many people contributed there. However, by far the largest instance to date was in, uh, I think, April, May last year, after uh, uh, an earthquake in Nepal, where, again, a number of mapping initiatives were coordinated by, by HOT, by the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. And I think, well, the, the, the estimates vary depending on who you ask, but uh, several thousand people participated, signed up specifically to help uh, Nepal. And we, we can... To, to, to show this, this, the same data in, in, a slightly, in a slightly different way, this is the cumulative growth of, of accounts of people who have signed up. This also means that these kinds of disaster events, they kind of draw crowds. When, when people want to help out, it's often in response to a specific kind of event. So for, these, for us, these are also always moments where our community of volunteers grows. So uh, as part of my work, I spend a lot of time looking at these kinds of data sets and trying, also trying to understand how can we reason about this kind of collective activity because there's, there are quite a lot of aspects to it. There, there are thousands of people across uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of initiatives. Then there's, there, there's a time dimension. There are different kinds of work and so on. So I, I, I spend a lot of time just visualizing the data in different ways, aggregating it in, in, in different ways. For example, here we see a timeline of, of contributors every year horizontal line here is a contributor, there's a dot when they do, when they contribute to the map, and then we see moments like these where a large number of uh, uh, contributors some, somehow is activated. And, and this was late 2013, so this was uh, ty <coughs> Typhoon Haiyan, which uh, re reactivated a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of our volunteers. Or another way of, of looking at the collective activity is this here. This is a timeline of project activity where I've taken the 1,000 1, or 1,200 projects, and I drew a timeline of the number of people who are contribute to each project at the, uh, the particular moment in time. And we see, based on this visualization, projects tend to be active in the beginning. There, there's often a spike, and then it tails off, maybe because the com project is, has been completed, or maybe because people moved on to other things. And some projects ap appear to have e eternal uh, lifetimes. This here, again, this big spot in the center, that's Nepal. Yeah, I think we're, we're I'll, I'll skip over that. It, it's, it's pretty, but it takes too many words to explain, and I think we're running late. Um, yeah, so as, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I'm looking at uh, a community contributor engagement in the, in the community. Uh, I'll just we quickly go through the, the kinds of studies that I've uh, done uh, and the kinds of questions I'm looking at. So we, we generally, we, we've now made, we, we have a pretty good sense that certain kinds of disaster events, they draw their own crowds. So generally, when, when something like Nepal happens, we don't have to worry that we don't have enough volunteers. Um, some people call these CNN moments. These are disasters that kind of promote themselves. We just need to make sure that we are well organized enough that we can give people something to do. However, there are other kinds of, uh, of initiatives, and that's the missing maps side. 
where we want to be proactive, where we want to make sure that we produce maps before they are needed. And in those cases, we don't necessarily have a crowd that we can rely on. So one of the, one of, uh, the, the, the organizer questions for missing maps, but also one of, my, uh, one of the questions that motivates my research is trying to understand how we build this kind of sustained community activity in the absence of an urgent cause. Uh, and I'm, I'm the, the, from a research perspective, the fascinating thing about HOTS and about missing maps is that you can already look at uh, an incredible range of activities online and offline, uh, an incredible range of uh, organizing practices as well. And there's a lot of observational data that's already there, that's already freely available. Um, so a lot of my work is actually based on that. Is, is I spend a lot of time I spend a lot of time with the community to make sure I understand the practice, to make sure I understand organizer concerns. Um, I also make sure that I, um, the, the, the research is informed by existing understanding and, and theory. But uh, fundamentally, the work is, uh, is a quantitative, is, is a, an, an empirical study of, um, an empirical observational study of contributor engagement in different kinds of settings looking at different aspects, task design, project purpose, coordination practices, uh, mapathons, and so on. Um, I think I'll skip a few of these things in the interest of time, but there's one thing that I maybe wanted to emphasize. So w w one of the things that's slowly coming out of this work, and that surprised me a little, I, I started looking at task design. My assumption was when people contribute, maybe they maybe a, a certain percentage of them gets frustrated with how we describe tasks. Maybe we ask for too much, or maybe our, we don't get, give enough guidance. So, so I, my initial sense was this is an important aspect to contributor engagement, where either people get frustrated too quickly, or somehow we find a magical task description with just the, the, the right kind of guidance that people are enjoying themselves, and things flow, and they stick around. So my uh, initial question was, was looking at looking at task complexity, task guidance, and so on. And I realized, nah, looking at the, the, the different kinds of experiences we've had in the past, task complexity maybe has, uh, might be a barrier to entry, but it's not really actually a big uh, engagement factor. It's not really a, a big um, determinant of whether people stick around or not. However, when, when I then compared the engagement trajectories of newcomers across different kinds of initiatives, uh, I found that different kinds of uh, initiatives have, have very different retention rates. And it was initi initiatives like Missing Maps, which use mapathons and other kinds of community building approaches, who had uh, by far the best retention rates. So I thought that maybe, maybe it's about the, the social settings, maybe it's about mapathons and so on, uh, uh, the, the social environments that get people uh, to remain engaged, that, that make, people, make people interested. Um, so, so I looked at uh, a, a range of uh, mapathon settings which will try and understand um, when we organize mapathons, uh, do, um, to try and understand, well, let me, let me so the, in my first study, I essentially found that the initiatives who employ mapathons had higher engagement. In a follow-up study, I'm then trying to understand, is it because of the mapathons? Do mapathons make a difference in whether people stick around? We might need to just clarify terms. What, what are mapathons? Okay. We live in that world, I'm not sure. Yes. Everyone <laughs> does. Have you explained what a mapathon is? I don't think we have. No. Um, just to separate from the yeah. other editing. So the... The, uh, we, we talked a little bit about the contribution process. Uh, fundamentally, in, in, uh, in, in remote mapping, people trace satellite images. And in principle, it's, it's, it's a task that many people can learn, but it requires a bit of technical knowledge. Uh, it requires specific uh, editing tools. Uh, so we, we, we essentially find that people with some kind of GIS background, they, get, they pick it up very quickly, and others might have a bit of a learning curve. Um, and so on one hand, learning the tools, but then on the other hand, also learning to read imagery. And Joey illustrated that earlier. Some, some things are really obvious, some things are hard. For example, uh, I had to learn, one of the first things I learned was, uh, on a satellite image, 
When there's a line, it could be a waterway or a road. When it's dark, it's most likely a waterway. And you don't know that unless someone has told you. Uh, so there, there is a bit of a learning curve. Uh -huh. And one of the ways in which we try and address that, or, or in which we try and spread that knowledge, it would be, uh, if we were to write a manual of all the things that you have to consider, it would be a really big book. Uh, but instead, we turn it into a social practice. Uh, and a really important part of our community building approach as, as HOT and as Messing Nuts is to create social contribution environments, which we call mathathons, like hackathons or marathons, uh, where people come together to learn the practice. Um, organizers are wondering, is it worth to, set, to put the effort into organizing these mathathons? Can we not simply have really good online tutorials? That was one of my motivating questions when I started looking at the research. In my first study, I had an indication that, yeah, probably mathathons increase engagement. I'm going to explain the chart in a, a, in a brief hand wavy way. There was an initial indication that, yeah, mathathons might make a difference. In the second study, I looked at the format specifically. I observed uh, a number of mathathons. I looked at what people did. I um, compared that with an online cohort of people doing the same kind of work, but online, meaning we, we don't know where they are. They might be at uh, an office, they might be at home. They might be in a group, we, we don't really know, but they're not at the mathathons that we observed. This here is, a, is, a, is what, what's called a survival plot. How many here has, uh, have heard of survival plots? Yeah, yeah, a few have. So essentially it shows the, what, what's called the survival rate or the likelihood that someone survives. It's, it's coming from medical research, so the term is, is maybe a bit unfortunate in, uh, in, uh, in the context of online community. But for our purposes, it tracks how long will people stick around. This is the moment when they attend the mathathon or when they do their first online contribution. And this here, this declining curve, is the likelihood that they will still be active at the moment in time. So this is a time frame of about 45 days. This is the mathathon cohort we observed. This is people who do the same work, but in an online setting. I'm now skipping over loads of details because I think we're really running out of time. But what's more and more, what's more and more becoming clear to me, if we if we are trying to figure out how do we build sustained capacity, uh, it's partially about the process. It's partially about the kind of work we do. Uh, it's probably also to an extent about the kinds of initiatives and and then to what extent people are familiar with with particular concerns or particular ge geographies. But more and more, I think it's also uh, uh, the, the evidence essentially points to the fact that the thing that really um, makes people stick around is, is community, is to have a shared social experience, is the, um, the ability or the, the, uh, the opportunity to receive peer support and guidance, but also the, the opportunity to feel part of a shared experience to join a community of practice. So what, for, for me, one of the, one of the questions that, that follows up, up from that is, can we provide similar kinds of experiences in an online setting? How can we, uh, what might that look like? Okay, skipping loads of other things. Uh, I think we're done, thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Um, we have we have a few minutes for questions, um, so I'll invite anyone. Re just a reminder that there's a camera on, so uh, you know we're we're recording these and webcasting this, but don't let that make you shy. Hopefully, uh, if you guys don't mind, I'll take the liberty. Yeah, time. the first one. Um, so um, it's probably a question you've thought about, but it's maybe a question you don't have an answer to. Um, so, you know, what you guys do is you, in the beginning you said what you do is you map the most vulnerable and you want to do it in an open way, right? Um, and I guess what my question is, is what are the vulnerabilities in mapping vulnerabilities? So, you know, like, like with your example of um, you map 7% of Sierra Leone and that's being done to do things like 
uh, planned vaccination programs or route uh, ambulances or wh whatever is happening. So, you know, it, are the people who are choosing what gets mapped and what doesn't get mapped essentially making life or death decisions because aid goes to one place and not another place? How, how do you grapple with that fundamental issue? Uh, as the aid person. <laughs> Um, so, yes, it's life or death, death decisions, but aid agencies are doing that all the time anyway. So they have to decide uh, which things get funded, how they get funded, how they're going to implement their work. Um, the vulnerability in the mapping is that the maps don't exist. So that's the vulnerability. If we have something to complain about, that's great. At the moment, we have nothing to complain about. So we're starting from a very low base. If we confuse a river and a pipe or a road, if we have the rest of the detail around it, it doesn't matter. Like it'll get clarified over time, like any wiki page. Like the fact that the page exists means that the conversation can be started and it sort of gets clarified. The um, yeah, one of the biggest questions we get is like, what if I do it wrong? And we're like, you, you've we've got something to fight about now. That's amazing. That's so much better than the nothing we had before. So in the Ebola regions, where Ebola started, there were no village names, there were no maps, there were no roads, there was nothing. Um, and the starting with the open street map community and HOT and sort of people running around it, and then the NGOs kind of focusing on different questions, and then um, the research coming about, okay, here we need uh, population count data to understand spread, and in this, these places we need village names for contact tracing. Um, and as, and the missing maps is about having that conversation with this capability to make the maps about where is useful to make maps. But the Red Cross or MSF or um, like different projects are different projects. So our operations dictate the areas we're interested in. Um, the maps follow that. And in one area we'll be very interested in village names, in another area it will be like a ho house count at the moment would be amazing or another place, and this is kind of going through the iteration of missing maps, is um, we've done the tracing, we've sent the maps back, and now this additional data comes back on. So the Bangladesh example was really interesting where they were doing um, heavy metal toxicity in the slums. Um, and the data that came back after the remote mapping had been done was about where the tanneries were and about, so they can, so the questionnaires and the epis, the epidemiologists that they sent out, um, would, we're now, instead of having no map, literally no map, we're now going with walking around streets, plotting the name and taking the photograph and um, where all the tanneries were. We had to digitize that so that the next round they could go with the questionnaires and kind of refine the heavy metal question. Mm -hmm. But that is starting with nothing and then because this kind of conversation that we're trying to improve, we're ending up with a very different operational program than we would have had previously. Yeah. So if I can so ask a quick yeah. follow-up. Are, are there, were there ever examples where, I'm, I'm not sure what was done sort of pre-OSM map or pre-helicopters? Literally, so there were examples of going to the field, you, you send a doctor and they like, I don't know what this village is, I don't know what, like how many people are there, where, what's the lay of the land. They literally have to hire a helicopter, trace maps. And, yeah. So my question then is, are, have you ever encountered examples where having an uh, incomplete map or having a faulty map turned out to be worse than the older way of not having the map in the first place? Was the, was the, was the incomplete information ever worse than the lack of information? No, the, the disproportionate, the, the having something versus having nothing is, it, it's more the, the, what the challenge is the appetite for more, where you start making that capacity available to people, and they're like, they're starting to just expect it like this, and like, oh, I'm going to that place next week, um, this is the field data I brought back last time, could I please have that well mapped on the thing, and they're like, why aren't there road names, and we're like, whoa, hang on, um, so it's more the, the appetite that we have to kind of triage and figure out the processes and tools to mm -hmm. um, do it. The, no, there's no, uh, no downside. So just, just also just to, to, to add to that, you, to me, your question is a bit about the implications of this work. Yeah. 
So now that we can do this, what does it mean? And how does it change things? Mm. And I, I think we also have to say that when it comes to that, on one hand, we, we are standing on the shoulder of decades of humanitarian aid experience, um, where a lot of mistakes they've already made, we don't have to make, we don't have to repeat. On the other hand, it's still a new kind of work uh, and a new kind of capability. And I think we're also only slowly learning what is it that we actually have to pay attention to. So for example, uh, after, after having done this for a few years, only now are we starting to have a more reliable feedback loop of data being available, work on the field happening as a result of it, and then project creators finding out how well it worked. For the longest time, there was uh, just an implicit trust that now these maps are there, someone is going to use them. And, we, and the people who started the work, they never were told what actually happened. So I, I would say it's, it's early days. Mm. Thanks. Uh, what, should we field some questions? Are you in touch? I was uh, curious about the role of language in uh, sort of mapping the maps that you've done. So I was looking at OpenStreetMap and some of the places have the local languages incorporated. And I would assume that a lot of grassroots workers are often, uh, you know, uh, operating at the local language, uh, you know, this thing. So I was wondering if in the community there's sort of some guidelines which talks about while mapping you should be sort of, you know, I just was curious about how language sort of plays a role and if there are some guidelines around it. I think the whole point of Open Street Map is everything is local. So if you look, there's all, you know, if you look in Greece, everything's in Greek. If you look in uh, Bangladesh, for example, everything is in Bangla. Um, and even if you end up in somewhere like the DRC or French-speaking countries, it's all in French. So we always ask, and the way if you look at how OpenStreetMap things are tagged, you always have the local name, and then you'll have translations further afield. So when we've done field mapping, we always have a local name and an English translation. So I spent a day translating a lot of things from French into English, but uploading both, this, both into OpenStreetMap. So, so does that mean that the places which are only in English but definitely operate on multitude of languages have not been mapped? It's either that they've not been mapped or they haven't been mapped with the, the local language. So for example, when we were doing street mapping in, in Dhaka, we did have um, Bangla, two, yes. two translations, and that's what we could enter into OpenStreetMap. We can only put onto OpenStreetMap what we have. Um, and so for example, if I didn't spend the day translating the French into the English, we'd have just had the French um, bridges, etc in the Central African Republic. So it's, it's everything to do with the community. Um, the idea is the local languages, obviously English, and then if you can add more, the whole point is you could sit there and add it if you wanted it to do that yourself. Um, and that's the value of the wiki, is it's a, it's a starting point. It's not, we're not writing the whole article, we're just um, kick-starting it and making sure that it serves our needs, the, the humanitarian needs often like the actual use case for for maps is far beyond the humanitarian um, and getting the local iterations of it is often kick-started by um, having something to play with um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I was just wondering um, what kind of approach do the government ha governments have for this exercise especially in conflict zones and places like that uh, have there been any problems uh, so, conflict zones are a, I'm going to put them as a slightly special case. Yeah. So, the field work, the way Missing Maps works is it's an overlap of the humanitarian ask and the um, open source GIS answer. Um, we only ask where we think it will benefit. So, we don't ask, for instance, in conflict zones. Like, if there's any if there's potentially any more harm than good coming out of it, we're like, no, it's, no we'll, we'll do another approach. Um, so all of the stuff we are mapping are far more, um, less sort of um, challenging humanitarian uh, issues. The, sorry, the other half of your question? No, 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 no. Conflict. <laughs> Conflict uh, so yeah, so basically from a missing maps perspective, we don't, we don't really go there because yeah. it's, um, it is complicated um, and there are different MSF and the Federation and the IFRC, um, the Red Cross mechanisms work differently in conflict zones than they would in the kind of things we're focusing on are um, things like cholera and Ebola and kind of more common ground things. And it doesn't even have to be open conflict. So one, one of the most 
most, most recent instances where people are considering should we, should we activate is the refugee crisis in, in Europe, where, uh, which is also uh, where, where maps play an important role in, in terms of finding transport routes, find, finding safe passage, uh, uh, but, but also um, uh, in, in terms of, 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 of uh, uh, national borders and, and all, all, all kinds of issues relating to uh, geographic data and access to geographic data. Uh, but the, the organizers I've spoken to so far, they, they tend to say, Let, let's watch it, but it's, it's, it might be quite, quite a touchy subject. And we might risk doing more harm or causing more, more trouble than, uh, than it's worth it. And there are other priorities. So if the, the way this works is it basically a task manager, which has a list of places and why we're mapping them. Different people care about different places. Um, it's kind of prioritized a little bit and by organization asking and by the complexity of the task. Um, yeah, so people kind of map what they care about to a large extent. There was a question in the back. Yeah, yeah I kind of got what my question was about, like how do you handle disputes you know, somebody says that the boundary of our village is here versus <coughs> there's a disagreement on, I guess, what's your standard of, you know, kind of authority for disputed data? Community. So it's the, it's the open street map part community that does that. If there's, there's something to fight about, we're happy from, from our humanitarian side. If, there, if we see a boundary or a village name, if they're like, wait, there are five different spellings and three different languages and, you know, brilliant. That's exactly the kind of um, discussion we can now have that we couldn't have before. Um, clarifying what admin boundaries things are in are really important from our side. So the fact that we can draw something and then somebody goes, no, actually it goes like this. And then you can go, oh, well, actually there's this disputed area in the middle. And like, okay, great, now we know that. Um, but we can only have that once we have something to have the conversation about. Um, yeah. Uh, there were, there's two more questions here. I, uh, yeah, I, I had a similar concern. I mean, like, uh, it's it's good to have these maps, but I mean, if you in, in, in a context where it's about a, a, a cholera, Ebola, I mean, everybody seems to benefit, but like the, these things stay stay there after the case. And I mean, especially when it comes to who owns the who owns the country or who owns the fields or who. I mean, in many many of these countries, there's no they don't have a contester or something, and then suddenly you like. Facts are made observations by someone. By but people. People, yeah. yeah, observations, but I mean, they're also maybe biased. So, I mean, like, how do you ensure yeah. not to spark a conflict maybe by making some decision? So, uh, decisions uh, are and made. I'd, I'd, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be. For instance, yeah. a certain, maybe a certain area belongs to some, but there are no ma you know, ethnic groups who use this land for like migrating, and suddenly it says, okay, this, this part belongs to us. Yeah. And then you send the conflicts, right? Yes. So I, I'm, this, this is not my experience. I, I, I don't make these decisions, but I spend a lot of time talking to organizers who mm -hmm. do make these decision, uh, dis decisions. And I'd also be interested in your perspective on this, Andrew. But, but to me, it's uh, in, in, in my, according to the conversations I've been having, uh, this is where it falls back onto the humanitarian aid model, where people uh, make sure that they are aware of these potential issues and when there is uncertainty, to reach out to local contacts, to local communities. And in, because in the end, it needs to be, uh, um, the, these issues, there's a, a very concrete awareness that these issues need to be raised and they need to be, uh, and, uh, and organizers need to be mindful of these kind of concerns. It's a very, to own land, it's a very, it's a very, Many yeah, we, we don't map land ownership. Yeah, uh, we, but, we, like we, uh, but, but I understand the... Yeah. Uh, I understand so the an interesting practical example uh, was a community map mapping project. Um, I was in Mozambique. Uh, Zimbabwe. I'm going to say Zimbabwe. Um, Red Cross goes in, proactively works with the, with the local Red Cross National Society, um, community mapping an area they're interested in working with the community to decide what to map. Um, and they invite everyone that will come, including the local government. And, so, yeah, yeah. and then there's this conversation about what do we map and what are we interested in? And the government, the local government, one saying, oh, we really want to know where the water pipes are because we think people have tapped into the water pipes and that's <laughs> not so good. Um, and then the community going, uh, 
Yeah, we're not going to do the water pipe thing. Um, but we're really interested in having the rubbish dumps because it's the council's responsibility to clear up the rubbish dumps. So having the rubbish dumps on the map in a visible way where they actually are um, would help the community with their conversation with their friends. But there's nothing stopping anybody from mapping anything. It's an open map. But our the community we were trying to engage and work with we would be following what they are interested in mapping and how they want to see their community represented. Um, so for instance, the, you had some nice photographs of hand-drawn maps. Yeah. That is not uncommon at all. A lot of the disaster risk reduction stuff we do is about, let's draw your community, where do you see risks, where are the, how do you mitigate them, that kind of stuff. And having the conversation to kind of open up that knowledge and we're now at the stage where people are coming to us with worn, with photographs of very worn hand-drawn maps and saying, oh, could you please digitize this before it disappears and then feed it back to us and make a big printout and we'll go and have the conversation again. Um, and they're mapping what they care about and we're putting it on and they'll correct it and, and it's, the, it's the iteration process. Uh, there are lots of other use cases for OpenStreetMap. Um, we're focusing on the humanitarian one, so we're approaching it from a humanitarian perspective. So if it was an engineering company or a mining company or something, it's, it would have, a, I think, more implications. Um, yeah. So we, we have time for one more question, and one's been waiting. So. so it's a bit related to this last question, how you manage consent and privacy. Yeah, for us, it's quite uh, standard to, to be on a map. Uh, I, I remember I, I worked in an NGO in Argentina, and they were mapping slums. and. There were people who were very happy because ambulances weren't going in because there were two people running the ambulance said, well, we don't really know where to go and we don't want to get lost in this place because mm -hmm. we'll be in trouble with strangers, etc. But other people were saying, basically, the police is going to come behind the ambulance and we don't want the police lurking around because they're a problem. How do you manage? Because if you have a holdout, you basically can't map a place. So who, who provides consent and how do you manage hold out uh, to say, well, I'm part of this town and I don't want the streets to be mapped because I'm not okay with that. I, I don't think there's a single process. Okay. I, I also think there are, there's, uh, there are no current experiences of a process breaking down in the manner that you and you described. So maybe it's, it's, it's a scenario waiting to happen. However, I mean, again, I, I defer to you, but, but I think the, in the end, the same thing applies, that there is existing experience within the humanitarian aid organizations who coordinate this work. And, uh, uh, and, and, and um, it is a matter of, of it's nev never a matter of, in these kinds of scenarios specifically, it's never a matter of making an objective decision. It's always a judgment call. Uh, and it will be made according to a, a set of principles that are decided within that uh, aid organization. So the missing maps focuses on where the maps are missing for operational use by humanitarian aid agency. Um, when it, and again, they will only ask the question if they're trying to do something sensible in the area. Um, the open street map and the, so that community I think runs into this kind of thing a lot more. Um, and the open model kind of mutes it because it becomes a, an edit war or a flame war. And, you know, somebody can add it, somebody can delete it, somebody can add it, somebody can delete it. There's no, and then the community builds up around that um, online as it would with a, a hot Wikipedia page um, about, okay, we're gonna restrict this access or we're defaulting to the standard or that kind of thing. Um, the fact that it's, there isn't a, a government or an institutional ownership of it is, a, I think, one of its, the wiki approach is one of its big um, drawing cards uh, from our side and the kind of transparency and the community ownership of it. And the German OpenStreetMap community is very different to the UK OpenStreetMap community, which is very different to the Bangladesh OpenStreetMap community. Um, they care about different things for different reasons. It's always local implications that they care about. Um, one of our guiding principles, one of those few things written down is that we're defaulting to the, we're engaging that local uh, component to the extent that it's there or trying to create it if it's not there. And, and also maybe just to turn around the question a little bit, uh, uh, when one of the hot organizers, Blake Girardo, uh, he likes to say that 
actually often the situation is, 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 is the opposite that the, the, the bad guys as, as you might call them but whatever the scenario is they often have maps they have access to satellite images or actual maps because they're military because they're police whoever they might be but uh, the, the, the local uh, neighborhood might not have maps so often the, 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 the situation the, these are concerns but often they are not necessarily the, the most immediate concerns so with that, maybe let's, let's bring this to an end. I want to, to thank everyone here for these really interesting questions, and especially thank the, the CMAPS team for sharing some of their knowledge today. Thank, thank you for sharing. Thank you.